Living Seed Media brings to you God's Word, which is His comprehensive equipment for changing lives. May the Lord impact your heart as you encounter His Word. For further inquiry or counsel, contact Peace House, P.O. Box 971, Boko, Benue State, Nigeria. Telephone numbers 0703-036359-0808-5150-610. Email address lsmedia at livingseed.org or visit our website at www dot livingseed dot org. Let us sit back and listen as the servant of God brings forth the word of life. On guidelines on the choice of marriage partner, we ask you to please minister to our hearts. We are asking that you will guide us and you will show us your message. You will not allow us to fall a prey at this point. Thank you, Father. In Jesus Christ's name, we have prayed. Amen. The age of the youth is the age of crucial choices. I think we have said that over and over again. Do you, do you agree with me? That this is the age of choice. This is the age of choice. It's not that choices finishes uh, as one grows old, you keep making choice. But I'm telling you, most choices you can make when you are older, they will only be a polishing or a panel beating of the choices you have made now. Are you hearing me? So, uh, because if you made a wrong choice, you will run into terrible chances in life. It is important for us to look at choices. Choices that affect his or her destiny in life and at old age are made at this segment of our lives. Choices made now are most irreversible. Damages incurred at this point are also irretrievable. Though life may lay ahead of you for many years, yet they may become useless and sorrowful years of struggle if right choices are not made at this time of your youth. Are you getting me? All right. One of such crucial choices is the choice of a life partner. I will be explaining some things to you today. I want you to know that actually it is not wrong that you are feeling at this point in your life about who should I marry in life is not wrong. It's because you are beginning to enter that segment where that choice is inevitable. Praise the Lord. And I want you to know that God himself is the one that arranges this segment of your life and has also given you interests to make this kind of choice. Since marriage is not a temporary estate into which you can enter and come out at will without any damage to your life, it then becomes necessary to take the utmost care and proper guidance from God who sees the end from the beginning before making the choice. Do you understand that now? Now, there are several things that maybe if you choose wrongly, you can easily change. Maybe there are a few things like that. One of it is career. Are you hearing me? I have known someone 
who, when we were in the campus, he was a brilliant student and he was a medical student. And he went as far as becoming a medical doctor. Are you getting me? He was classmate with my wife. They were classmates, medical doctor. And uh, he went as far and became a consultant. Last, is it last month or somewhere in September last year when we went to drop our boy in school? I just ran into him. I said, oh, doc, what are you doing now? He just said, I put that up. I said, what are you doing now? He said, he's into computer. Do you understand that now? He left that and he's now doing computer. There are professors that have left their career now and they have become photographers. Do, 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 do you understand that now? Uh -huh. So you know what I'm pointing to you? Even the choice of care, as important as it is, if you miss, choose a career, you can always change it. Not without some damage and setbacks, so, but you can always change it. Such change, choices can be changed. The choice of career is not a do or die battle. If you thought you were going to be an engineer and you got in and you couldn't make it again, eh? You can find something else. You can even change to be a, I mean, part, uh, motor part sellers. And if you are doing it well, you make money. So career, even if you make a, 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 a mistake in the choice of career, which do is painful, I don't want you to do that. Even that is still not the worst. Because it is, you can change it can change it. I've seen people that at 50, they decided to go and learn something else. No problem. But there is a choice that you can't change it without a permanent damage in your life. And it is the choice of your life partner. I'll be explaining what that means uh, when I get to the body of the message itself. So why should we take this discussion so seriously? Is that it is one choice you will make in the days of your youth and it determines for life until death do you part what your life will look like. Praise the Lord. I have met people now that speak very lightly about marriage. Who says, it doesn't matter, just look and pick. And if you don't like again, you dump, you pick another one. I want to tell you, those men are wicked. They are wicked teachers. And they are not sincere. They are people that Yoruba man calls Ajibudu. That is looking for some people to join him. Someone whose life is already damaged. And is looking for company. May you not join their company in the name of Jesus Christ. There is no man that has a good marriage. That is enjoying his marriage. That will encourage you on the matter of divorce. Huh? When you hear a pastor beginning to tell you, ah, well, in fact, in this, watch him. In a few years' time, he will divorce his own wife. If he had not done it. The reason is because he himself is only looking for Bible to support his own mischief. Any time you make a wrong choice in marriage, 
it leaves your life with a permanent problem. You cannot, no matter what, it's there for life. Only God can help you. So, why should we give this a magnitude of instruction? It is because it's a choice that God will want you to make and make it properly and appropriately in the name of Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. And because the marriage choice, the choice of a life partner, is for life. It's not a temporary estate. It then becomes necessary to take the utmost care and proper guidance from God who sees the end from the beginning. You see, the reason now is this. Can I tell you something? The brother that you see today that is a Jim, 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 Jim brother, do you know his tomorrow? Eh? No. That's also why you can't even depend on what he is today to make the choice. You are not hearing me. If what a man is today is what he will always be, ah, we will have said it's all right. Uh, Brother Peter, do you remember the house me and you went? What was that brother on the campus? He was the president of the Christian Union in one of the biggest universities in Nigeria. Tongue talking. Feel with the spirit. For you to be a president of a university like Nsuka or Ibadan, you know you, you must be serious. In those days, and this beloved sister, very sound Christian sister Abby, they got married. They were our friends. One day I landed in Ibadan to preach. And this sister ran. Bragbile, you need to come and talk to your friend. Luckily for me, our brother, before we have been friends for years, he told me, he said, do you know, he mentioned his first name, the one I know, because we went to the same secondary school. He said, I know he respects you. When we got there, this man was a brilliant architect. They built a good house, five-bedroom house, very beautiful. But now, when we got in there, because of their marriage that has now started to scatter. What has the brother done that time? He built a partition. He raised a wall now. Cutting off two rooms. And then he put the sitting room, the kitchen, and every good thing on this other side that he is his own. And his wife is in. And there was light on his own side. <laughs> and there was no light on the side of the woman. Now, listen to me. Do you understand what I'm talking about? If to say you have a way of knowing the, ten, the next 10 years of the brother who is proposing to you, I would have said to you, look at him very well. And if you like what he is today, pick him. You see, why we are talking about seeking proper guidance from the Lord before you pick any man or before you pick any sister is because marriage for you is not in the present, it's in the future. And you don't know that future. You don't know what it will be. If anybody tells me that that brother will do that, I can never believe. But he did it. That's the issue we are raising. 
The issue we are raising is that marriage is different from pulpit. Are you getting me now? Oh, somebody, yes, hallelujah, glory, yes. I want to tell you a secret. Maybe you don't know. Can I tell you a secret? And young guys, I want you to hear me. I'm telling you frank things. When a man comes on the pulpit, are you hearing me? He becomes another man. It may not even be because of it. It may be because of the congregation. Maybe the congregation have been saying, oh God, speak to us, speak to us, speak to us. And God wants to speak, even if he finds a, go a goat. And God will speak. So you see, you don't marry anointing. You marry a man. <laughs> you say that now. Uh -huh. So if what you saw is the performance on stage that makes you say yes to a brother. You are a foolish girl. It means you are married performance. That is why people that you thought are great on the pulpit, when you go and meet their wives, I also had another experience. These are reasons why we decided that now that we have opportunity as, as, as God's servants, why don't we guide you now that you are young? Is that all right? And we need to be frank. I went again to a, 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 a meeting. This was my own very, very close a brother, we were in the same fellowship. We were in the same president Esco. Oh, in those days, seven of us, we ruled the whole fellowships. We prayed. Serious things were happening. And I didn't expect that any of us in that president Esco will have a problematic marriage. I never expected. Are you understanding? And this man, beloved brother, if anybody told me that he would ever lift up his hand to beat his wife and say, no, it can't happen. Ah, such a gentleman of God. What I want you to know is this. The gentility you see in a brother when he's not married is untested gentility. Are you hearing me? It's untested though. When he's married, then you see something. So I just went to the town where he is. He's already a lecturer. And it was terrible when I discovered the kind of fight that they are having. This is a man that when he's doing exposition of the Bible, all of you job is saying, mm, mm, mm. But why? What is the problem? The issue of choice and the issue of principles of Christian marriage. I went to another place. My friend invited me to preach. And I'm lodged in his house. And his wife, that was also a very wonderful Christian sister that we knew. So as we are going in and out, preaching and coming back, she whispered to me, "Say, brother Billy, I say yes. I would like to talk to you. I would like to talk to you. You know, I was surprised." That she would like to talk to me and she's whispering, not in the presence of her husband. I say, What happened? He said, That's that's the problem. 
He will not let me talk to you. The, man, the woman said, I am dying. All this giri giri giri, you see, it's not so, it's not so, it's not so, it's not so, ah. I said, ah, so it's not so. When she began to talk to me, I was afraid. And she told me, she said, the only thing that stopped me from committing suicide in the last two months is the fear of where will I go. I will end in hell. That's why. But I'm not sure I can survive. And just before, and I started talking and I said, okay, I'm going to send you some tapes and all of this, all of this, all of this. Not quite three months, she died. You see, my eyes have seen. And I look and look and I found that if the foundation is shaking, what can the righteous do? Listen. This choice is a bridge between where you are now and your future. We thought it necessary and crucial to invest some quality time of study on this matter. There are many things we could have said in this, in this Congress, but we believe that we won't be preparing you to be heirs kings and priests that God wants you to be if we allow your marital life to be damaged because of a wrong choice. Praise the Lord. So, but there's a promise that I want to start with. God has made a promise. Psalm 32, I want someone to read it. Psalm 32, verse 8. I want someone to read it from other King James and then someone to read it from Good News and someone to read it from Living Bible, if there is. Oh, yes, I know. That's what I'm looking for. I will instruct you, yes. Man of God, we already have one man here, sir. Yes, sir. Yes. Okay. Praise the Lord. Who is having living Bible? The old living Bible. The sister here. Yes. Stand up, read. Let's know what you have. One sister is there. Uh -huh. The Lord says, I will guide you along the best pathway for your life. I will advise you and watch over you. Did he say I will watch over your progress? Eh? Over your progress. Old living. We need old living here. Yes? Yes, sir. Yes. Amen. Read verse 9. Uh huh. Talk. Don't be a senseless horse that you need bits and bridle in his mouth to keep it where in line because he always wants to go into the bush. But I will instruct you along the best pathway for your life. It's not every good looking sister today that carries a tangible destiny eh? it's not every robust chick that can run with you for life so if you marry a singing girl because she sings 
but you don't know that she's not only a singer, she's a stinger. When she begins to sting your life, then you will sing new songs, isn't it? <laughs> Praise the Lord. So, but God has made a promise, and it is because of that promise that we can go on with this discussion. May God help us in the name of Jesus. Now, there are some general issues that we will have loved to spend time to talk about. But because this meeting itself is not all about marriage, we couldn't do that, so I will be recommending to you some text that you can study, at least to give you what is the biblical principle and perspective of Christian marriage. And before you get into any choice, you need to have an understanding of that. You need to be able to say, okay, oh, marriage is not just something I rush into because everybody is doing. I want to be careful. In Genesis chapter 2, from verse 18 to 25, and Proverbs 18, verse 22, 19, verse 14, I think we should read Proverbs 18, 22, and 19, 14, and Ecclesiastes chapter 3, we will have some general preambles. Um, Proverbs 18.22. Can I read Proverbs 18.22 here? Uh, because we may need to put it in the tape. He who finds a wife finds a good thing and obtains what? Favor from the Lord. And chapter 19 verse 14, what did he say? Houses and riches. What are they? They are an inheritance from fathers, but a prudent wife. Where do you get it? It's from the Lord. It's from the Lord. It's from the Lord. I want you to keep those two passages at the back of your mind because they will guide us as we go on. General introduction and preamble. Marriage was instituted by God. Is that all right? So let's know that marriage is not from the devil. Marriage is not created by the devil. It was instituted by God. So when you think of marrying, you are not doing anything wrong. Is that all right now? As a young sister, when it is occurring to you that you will get married one day, it is not wrong. It is good. Brother, when it is dawning on you that, ah, you need someone you will marry in life, it is not wrong. God himself created the, the issue of marriage and places it as a desire in the heart of both men and women. So don't think what to fight is the desire to marry. Don't fight it. It's not wrong. Is that all right now? Don't think that you are kana. If your mind should go and say, hey, who will I marry? You are not kana. That's not what makes you kana. Marriage was instituted even before carnality was born. <laughs> are you understanding that now? So marriage is not anything to do with carnality. It's spiritual, it is godly, and it comes from God. But the first thing we notice there is that it was God in Genesis chapter 2 verse 18 that says, did you notice in Genesis 2 18 that God himself said, let's read 2 18, Genesis 2 verse 18. What did he say? And the Lord God said, it is not good that man should be alone. I will make for him what? A help meet for him. A help meet for him. So, sisters, what did God call the woman in that passage? 
a help meet for him. God did not say, I will make a trouble in his life. You see, in Genesis, God didn't intend women to be trouble at all. It's help meet. Now, when it is time, and I'll be talking about such things, you will understand that in God's mind, though, he is creating something in you as a lady which is going to meet the need of someone else so that both of you can fulfill the will of God on us. May I inform you, sister, that you don't fit everybody. You are not made to fit anybody, anywhere, anytime. That's not how you are made. Praise the Lord. Brothers, not every sister you see on the road is your size. Are you with me? Uh -huh. Some of you, the girl you are running after now is undersized. How many of you have gone mistakenly to the shoe shop and you bought a very good, I mean, a, a shoe, cover shoe that is undersized? You are supposed to be 43, and then they got you 40, 41. How do you go with it? Eh? Let's imagine that your leg entered it. Please, sister, tell us. How? Yes. It, it does what? Oh, God, it pinches everywhere. In fact, this one, like this, will just suddenly, you're, 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 you're having blisters. And you can't walk with it, though. Why? That man is wearing undersized shoes. Do you know that there is a size for you? Uh -huh. And except you will wait for God to bring the one that is your own size. It's like you are ready to walk with a shoe that will forever pinch you. How can you run when the shoe that's supposed to help you to walk fast is not the one that is pinching you? To stand, you can't stand. To sit down, you can't sit down. And you know, when I have had such shoes, what did I do? I removed it because it was actually better to be walking barefooted. <laughs> and I carry my shoe like this. Now, but that's the trouble now. If it is marriage, you cannot remove it and be walking there for ten days. <laughs> and, and even if you do, if you do, you will still carry your load like this, and then you will be going. So the hand you will have used to carry a load, it became a load. So God said, "It is not good that the man should be alone. I will make and help meet for him." The one that fit in. The one that will meet his needs. Finding a life partner is good. A partner given by the Lord is an expression of his favor. You can inherit material things from your parents, but it is only God that can give you a prudent life partner. There is need to trust God to make a choice for you. Amen. Now, in that Genesis chapter 2, we saw God saying, it is not good that the man should be alone. Who spoke? All right. That's very important. Though. Before we can 
ever think of choice. Before you start looking here and there, you need first to hear something from heaven. And what is that? It is not good for you to be alone. When God has not seen it, that it's not good for you to be alone, if God has not yet seen it, what should you do? It means it is good for now, for you to be what? To be alone and be going alone. God knows why. When I'm coming back to deal with this, I will be telling you that some of you, you've entered into courtship too early. When it is not good for you to be, I mean, to be joined, you got joined, and your journey got confused. So, we must note that it was God, and for any marriage to be correct, God has to say it again. As he said it for Adam, he will say it for each one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ. God has set time for everything. That's what we find in Ecclesiastes chapter 3, verse 1. You need to know what God's time for you to marry. Ever before you begin to seek a life partner, you must first sort out whether God has said it is not good for you to be alone or not. God spoke concerning the first man, and I said he can speak concerning you. Pressures both inside and outside should not push you into an untimely marriage. Are you with me now? Now, listen. There are a few things I'm trying to set out as general preamble before I go into guidelines. The first issue is that God has time for every one of us. And it is only when God said it is not good for you to be alone that's when he will start to make arrangement for the help that is meet for your life. Are you, are you hearing me now? Now, if God has not seen it, that it's not good for you to be alone, it means it is good for you to continue with God the way you are for now. God has reasons. But generally, do you know what happens? Can I tell you what happens? Peer pressure. Peer pressure makes you to want to get hooked with someone even when God has not spoken. For example, sometimes when you come for fellowship and sometimes we are talking and then uh, this will <laughs> that's my special sister. And as he says that, Another one comes and said, <clears throat> Mr. Rose, just thank God. So unconsciously, something tells you, ah, why, why me alone? I better look for one also. So you now see Christy. And before you know it, you are walking up yourself into a relationship that God has not seen in heaven and he has not spoken about. So peer pressure is not the reason to start a relationship. Is that all right? That all your friends seem to be getting hooked is not important as to make you jump in. Praise the Lord. And the fact that, you know, and there are some other things that causes it. Sometimes when you are invited to attend a Christian wedding, do you know how serious that thing normally happens? Once you go for a wedding, as the bride is coming in in immaculate white, and she's doing like this, one step forward and two step backward, and all of this, Something is ringing in your head. Oh God, what of me? What of me? 
What of me now? What of me now? What? I must get something now, oh God. I give you one man. I give you one man. I give you one man in the name of Jesus. <laughs> now, all of those things, they are not the reason to rush into making a choice. God must say it. God must do what? Must say it. I'll tell you why. There are times that the person you are seeing now around you is a shadow. You didn't know that he's a shadow. And a mist that will soon disappear. But they are the ones that have dominated your environment. Like some of you are in the fellowship now. And as you are looking, you say, brother this, brother this, brother this, brother this. Those are the only brothers your eyes are seeing now. And these are mists. What did I call them? They are just ordinary mists. If you grab them, how many of you have been able to capture mist before? Eh? You saw something like a cloud and you rush, you want to capture it. And it became something in your hand. And they are supposed just to pass. But because you thought that, oh, since they are the only ones I'm seeing, let me quickly start something. You will start into trouble. Praise the Lord. When I was a young man, we were in the, we used to have a fellowship and we went to villages to preach and we go here and there. Brothers and sisters, we used to travel like that. And then, each of the brothers were beginning to pick each of the sisters. And when this one picks this one, they will come and tell me, say, uh, Bile, you know. I say, what? They say this. I say, okay. They will pick this one. They are picking. And suddenly, I discovered that there is pressure now. Nobody told me to go and pick. But then there was a pressure. What of you? And just as I was going to take a step to also go and say something. <laughs> you know, you know how we normally go to try to say something. I think God loves me so much. So I prayed one day and the Lord said to me, do you know that your wife is not coming from this environment? That all these ones you see now, they have no destiny for where I'm carrying you. Allow all these your friends to pick whichever one they want. It was very interesting. Sometimes, it is God who wants you to walk alone so that he can train you and prepare you and create in you values and virtues that is needed for your future. Which any other person in your life at that time will destroy it. And so God says, no, 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 no. And you see the sister I will have picked Eh? She's a backslider today. She was zealous. She had just been delivered from some demons. And you know, you know when some sisters are just delivered from demons, they have testimonies. They're always talking. Oh, testimony. I'm like, lady, did you see this thing? Oh, praise God. Let's pray right now. Let's fire prayer. All of those things. It looked like the part they want to pick. And it will be a disaster. She doesn't love Jesus now. I don't know where she is. So, it's important to let God say it is not good. Even though your age looks important, God's voice is much more important. 
Are you noting me now? You get this now. Now that you are on campus, maybe some of you, you just enter campus this month. Like it happened to me. Hi. You know, when I got to campus, JJC that I was. But because before I went to campus, I had been involved in Christian work here and there. And I have formed a drama group before, and we have been doing drama to win souls. So once I got to the family and they said there is an ICU drama group, oh, I was ready. So when I got to the drama group, the, the brothers and sisters, they were... They were, we were, they were doing a drama. <laughs> doing a drama. So as soon as I walk in like this, one sister, very good looking, pretty sister, just came and heard me. I said, um, and I want to introduce to you <clears throat> my newest catch. This is going to be my special friend. I think she was doing drama. <laughs> but you don't do drama with such volatile problems. That thing gave me trouble. It gave me trouble for several months. Because when I sat, she would come and sit with me. She said, I didn't even visit her. Now I took it to be drama. Then it was a problem. <laughs> now, you know sometimes the liberty you find in the campus can confuse you. The liberty of association, the liberty of uh, people expressing this and saying that and moving and doing this could cause you confusion. And you could be having movements in your heart. Don't let your heart move if it is not God that has moved in it. Is that all right? Brothers, you need to note that so that you don't fall into a trap. Praise the Lord. So, God has a reason as a child of God for bringing you into this world and into his own fold. God has a reason. According to Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10, would somebody check Ephesians chapter 2 for us? I want you to check something there very quickly. Ephesians 2 and verse 10. Where is workmanship? Let's hear from the sister this time. Where is workmanship? Yes. Uh huh. You see now, we are God's workmanship created in Christ Jesus uh, unto good works that God beforehand has ordained that we should do what? Walk in them. Which means that even each one of you here, God has some definite work that he wants you to accomplish in your lifetime. Do you know that? There's something you were born to be. There's something you are born again also to accomplish in the family of God. And it is for that purpose that God is going to bring a help to help you fulfill it. Are you hearing me now? So it means that marriage is not first of all a flimsy relationship. It's a relationship for a purpose. <clears throat> it means that there is something God wants to do with your life that he needs this lady to stand with you to fulfill it. And it is not necessary to run into relationship when you don't know where you are going in life. Amen. And sister, if God has called you a help meet for someone, and the man is doing nothing in his life. What will become of you? Eh? You will become nothing. Because he is doing nothing and you are only to help him. <laughs> he 
it means you'll be happy, amen, to do nothing. And I want to warn you, my dear sisters, you may be greatly endowed by God. And God has put some wonderful gifts of the Spirit in your life. But those gifts, those graces, and that ability is being tailor-made to fit into someone's life with whom you will be able to fulfill the purpose of God. If you do not find that right life, both your gift, your grace, will be jeopardized and it may be a waste. So it's not just enough to see a man and say he's good. You must be asking, what is he meant to achieve in life that I'm supposed to help him? What, where is he going in life that God, you want my life to join him? Those questions, they are questions you should ask every time before you say yes to anybody at all. Marriage is a means of doing that work and fulfilling that call. You must discover your purpose and focus in life for which you need help, for which you are a help. Ask God. He wants you to praise the Lord. <clears throat> Do you follow me to that point? Now, the next thing I want to say, I'm paraphrasing all of this. It says, I will make for him. Still in verse 18 that we have read, I will make for him. Did you see God talking now? I will make. So who makes? It is God. It's not another man that makes a woman for himself. God makes a woman for a specific man. It is God that makes. He made the man and he made the woman. Wait for God. To make it happen for you and to you. When he makes, he makes a fitting spouse. Hallelujah. God has the dimension of your life. And he knows the challenges that you will face in the future. So if you allow him, he will make and give you someone that will fit into your life properly. Not only for a short while, but for all the time. Can I take one minute to explain that? You see, every time you want to make a dress, not the ready-made you go to buy. You know there's a problem with ready-made. What is the problem with ready-made? It's oversized or undersized. It's general. It's a general thing. They just say, okay, uh, 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 waist 32, length 41, uh, uh, chest 15, and then anybody that fits. It's different from when you go to a tailor and he takes the tape rule and he measures everything. Measures your neck. He measures between your neck and your chest and he checks everything. And then he measures everywhere. By the time it comes out, how does it come out? Fitting. It brings out all about you in a very peculiar way. So the first thing I want you to know is that only God has the dimension of your life in hand. And so when he makes a woman or he makes a man for your life, he makes it with that dimension in mind. Oh, you are not hearing me. And you see, God is not only making the dimension that you can, is present. He also knows the elastic limit. You see that now? These guys, they're happy. Now, he knows, you see, you know, you know some, some, some of you don't understand that. You see, God determines 
the coefficient <laughs> of your elasticity, you know, your expansion. You see, some of you don't understand that. God may want you to, to be like this. He didn't have to create you like that. He does this. But add a kind of coefficient of elasticity so that as you are growing, that thing is doing what? Is expanding proportionately. Do you understand that now? Now, this, are you hearing me? Now, when God is going to bring you a wife, he brings it with the knowledge of your elastic limit. He already knows that this man is going to expand to this. This is going to be the kind of dimension in which it will be. God is going to bring a woman with the same elastic coefficient. A woman also who is having the same coefficient of expansion like yourself. So that as you are growing in your own life, what is happening to her too? She's also growing so that at every time it's fitting. If it fits this year, in 20 years time, it will still fit. Do you know why? 20 years has brought an elastic expansion to your life and it has also brought to her so she's fitting almost every point. But the unfortunate thing is this. Some of you, you are only looking at someone that fits you now. You don't think of your elastic expansion. You are not thinking of that. Are you hearing me? So, when the years come and you have become like this and she is still so small, the whole thing becomes jege, 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 jege. Am I right? It no longer fits. He said, ah! But he used to fit me when I was, when we started. Is there, where? I also didn't know you would change. When it is God, that makes, he takes into consideration all the circumstances of your growth, all the circumstances of the challenges, all the circumstances of your expansion, and all that will ever happen. He puts them together. So you see, when God makes a woman for a man, listen to me, in that woman, God has put potentially all that this man will need as he keeps growing in life. It may not manifest today. Praise the Lord. I'm telling you, there are some people that fit you today. But in 10 years time, they don't fit you. I want to ask you, do you want the one that fits you today? And in five years time, it will be undersized? So, the reason for you to let God make this choice and make the woman is because he, he is tailor-made. God makes your partner the kind that grows with you, expands with you, and fits always into every stage of your growth and of your development and of the call of God on your life, no matter what is happening. May the Lord give you understanding. So do you see that with everything I'm saying, when you come to the matter of choice, it becomes a very critical matter that you don't say, hey, let me just choose one. Let me just choose one. 
Don't just choose one. What did I say to you? Don't just choose one. The one that fits you today may be an undersized tomorrow. Praise the Lord. So the question for us is what are the steps then unto knowing the specific person? Have you are we ready for that now? Did you follow to where I've reached? Did you see now that it's not something to rush? It's not because she's looking fine today that you are thinking she will be always there. Don't. Experiences have shown us that it's not always like that. Praise the Lord. So God says, I will make so let's return to Genesis chapter 2, all of you, quickly. Genesis 2. Now I'm going to specific guidelines, and I will be as practical as possible. Uh, when we can stop, I will stop, and then ask you to look at it. 21. Because God said, I will make, in verse 18. Hallelujah. In verse 19 and 20, we were told that there was a lot of search. But there was none that is fitting among all the animals. I can see some people now, they are getting... I was reading in the newspaper when somebody got married to his animal. You know when you both people are confused. They are confused though. I want you to be very careful. And the Lord God caused a deep sleep eh, to fall on Adam. And he did what? And he slept. And he took one of his ribs. And what did he do? He closed up the flesh in its place. We are looking at specific steps to knowing the specific person. And we are reading the verse 21 to 23. I've read 21 now. Can I go on to verse 22? Then the rib which the Lord God had taken from man, he made into a woman, and he brought her to the man. And Adam said, This is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She called woman because she was taken out of man. Praise the Lord. Now, can you quickly, someone, help me to look at Jeremiah 29, 11? Jeremiah 29, 11. Yes. Yes. That's it. I, you don't know that something is happening here. Yes. Go ahead. Yes. Uh huh. Good. Praise the Lord. I alone knows the plan that I have for you. There are plans for good and not for disaster. Tell somebody, I say, God is not planning disaster for you. And your marriage will not be a disaster. <laughs> Hallelujah. Yes. Now, because God says, I know the thoughts, and I know the plans I have for you. They are plans for good and not for disaster, to give you a future. You see, when I'm reading the Bible, I'm so excited. God is not just talking about giving me what is present. Do you know that what is present is not important? The most important thing is the future. It's the future. If it is present marriage, uh, there's no problem. You can actually marry anybody you like today. Go to a wedding. We we'll go and eat. But what is the future? A man, I think a brother and his sister got married. They were wedding girl. And during their honeymoon, 
the day after there was gore. This gore was so much that for several years their marriage never worked well. In fact, sometimes we brought them to be with us for intensive care units. Just to see how to revamp that. Uh, Emmanuel. Emmanuel is not here now. How we attended a wedding in his church some years ago. And the whole thing landed for two weeks. After two weeks, the whole marriage was finished. If it is the present that you are worried about, you can marry anybody. If you are not interested about the future that has hope, uh, forget what I'm saying. Pick any girl you like. Make a seven-step cake and call all of us. What happens thereafter, don't tell us about that. But God is not planning just what people can see. It's a future and what a hope. We want to see marriages that after 20, 30, 40 years, they're still fitting. They're still moving together. And the Lord's glory is breaking forth in their lives over and over and over. That's what we're looking for. And God will give to you in the name of Jesus Christ. So Psalm 37, 1 to 7. Now we need to read that carefully because we are going to study steps. We are dealing with steps. 37, Psalm 37. Can you all go to Psalm 37? Please do so quickly. Psalm 37. Who has seen it? Okay, let me read from here. It's an important passage. Do not fret because of the worse or about the wicked. Don't be envious of the workers of iniquity. For they shall soon be cut down like the grass. And they will wither as a green herb. Trust in the Lord and do good. Dwell in the land and feed on his faithfulness. Delight yourself also in the Lord, and he shall give you what? The desires of your heart. Commit your way to the Lord, trust also in him, and he shall bring it to pass. He shall bring forth your righteousness as the light, and your justice as the noonday. Rest in the Lord, and wait. How? Patiently for him. Do not fret because of him who prospers in his way, because of the man who brings wicked schemes to pass. Does anybody have any version that says, rest in the Lord and wait patiently for him to act? What version is that? New Living Bible? NIV, good news. Let me hear good news there. Be patient and wait for the Lord to do what? To act. These are very important statements that I want you to bear in mind. Now, the first guideline. Now, can we take that? The first guideline here is to rest. When God said, I will make for him a help, meet for his life, you know, immediate thing. What did God do to the man immediately? He caused him to sleep, a deep sleep. And the man slept. What does that mean? God is our father and we must trust in his loving kindness over our lives. God must be given the liberty to work on our lives and for our lives. The principle of sleep that we saw in that scripture is not that of carelessness, but of casting your cares upon Jesus. Now, let's start by saying, B, 
because it is God that will make that woman for you, and it is God that will bring that man to your life, God needs liberty. To do what? To walk. Let me ask you, when you go to a doctor and they want to do operation, they want to do a surgery, what do they do? Eh? They will put you to what? To sleep. They will give you a heavy dose of anesthesia. Why? Hey, Dr. Toby, where are you now? Why do you do that to your patient? Before you open them up, stand up and tell us now. Two major reasons. All right. See, you know sometimes doctors, when they are doing a very serious operation and they are tired, they can leave your stomach open and keep the intestine on this other side and go and sit down for some time and uh, they do it like this and then you may even take care of something and come back again. What makes that possible now? What makes it possible? You are sleeping. Now, the need to sleep is to give God the liberty to make the choice and to do the work without your interference. Imagine a doctor that is opening somebody's stomach and the person is not there. Say, yeah, doctor, no, 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 don't cut that one. No. You see, even though I believe you that you are a doctor, but I don't think you should cut that one. <laughs> What is going to happen? <laughs> There's going to be trouble now. Everything will be in trouble. And that's the trouble. Many of you want God to give you a wife. Abby? But you are not sleeping. As you think that God is trying to go towards this. He said, no, no, Lord. No, Lord. No, Lord. No, Lord. Let your will be done, but not this direction. <laughs> And you know, quietly, you are using some, some wisdom to guide the Lord's hand in the direction that you are, <laughs> you are looking. Now, that kind of thing causes problem. The first thing God needs from us to give us the right choice of a partner is total surrender. God wants you to totally do what? Surrender. And so when he calls the man to sleep, it's for God to do something in his life before he can bring the right woman. And so, there are a few issues I want to say here as we talk about what does it mean? What's the implication of this sleep that God is asking you? That is, this sleep means it's not close your eyes. That's not what we're saying. Is that all right? We are not saying, um, it doesn't matter. Uh -uh. We are not saying that, just close your eyes, anybody that you pick, you just do like this. And we say such a man is sleeping actually. It's not sleeping. So, what are the implications of this life of surrender? Which means, Brothers, sisters, now that it is coming to your mind that God will want you to have a life partner, what is the next thing to do about that matter? Sleep over it. Relax over it. Surrender it completely to God. Number one, stop fretting. Stop being what? Stop fretting. Stop being anxious. 
Stop being worried. Marriage is not for competition and you cannot make a good choice in anxiety. Don't be anxious. Stop looking here and there and say, hey, all the sisters, they have picked them up. They have picked them up. You know sometimes because you are not sleeping, when you are eyeing a sister, you are eyeing a sister, and she's now standing up to just, maybe she stood and they were talking with a brother. Brother, do you understand what I'm talking about? <laughs> so you quickly go around there and say, eh, <laughs> eh, sister, you know, I, I really need to talk to you. I'm sorry, bro. I'm sorry, but I need to, I need to talk to you. <laughs> Why did you do that? Now? You see, it's because you are doing what? You are fretting. You are anxious. You think that if you don't quickly go and do something, that brother may catch out. 